Hey everybody, it's Pastor Stephen here with another episode of Ask Anything, where you submit your questions about the Bible, theology, or the Christian life, and I make an attempt to answer one of those questions in each video episode. And for this episode, we're going to be looking at a very specific New Testament passage, and it's found in 2 Corinthians chapter 12. So I'm going to read you the passage, and then we'll get to the question. Uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 12 verses 1 through 4 say this. Paul says, I must go on boasting, though there is nothing to be gained by it. I will go on to visions and revelations of the Lord. I know a man in Christ who 14 years ago was caught up to the third heaven, whether in the body or out of the body, I do not know. God knows. And I know that this man was caught up into paradise, whether in the body or out of the body, I do not know. God knows. And he heard things that cannot be told, which man may not utter. This is an interesting passage and one that people often ask about. I had actually two different people submit a question about this passage. And there's actually several questions that come up when we get to this passage. One basic question is, who is this man that Paul is talking about here? A second question is, when did this vision happen? A third question is, what does he mean when he refers to the third heaven? That's a central question that a lot of people ask about this, is what is the third heaven? And then we might just ask generally, what was the nature and purpose of this vision altogether? So let's look at those questions one at a time. First of all, who is this man that Paul is talking about? Virtually all biblical scholars agree that Paul was talking about himself here. He is the one who had the vision. And the reasons that we know this, even though Paul is, is speaking in the third person, the reason we know it's Paul that he's referring to here is that he knows the exact time that this vision took place. He has precise knowledge of it. And also, if you read on in chapter 12 where Paul talks about this thorn in the flesh that he has, it becomes very clear when he speaks about the thorn in the flesh that that's related to the vision that he had, and he talks about himself as the one who who had this vision. So if you go down to verse 7, for example, he says, So to keep me from becoming conceited because of the surpassing greatness of the revelations, there it is, the vision, a thorn was given to me in the flesh, a messenger of Satan to harass me, to keep me from becoming conceited. So it's very clear Paul is talking about himself here in this chapter and that he is the one who had this mysterious vision. Why does he refer to himself in the third person at the beginning of chapter 12? Well, probably because he says he's not wanting to boast about this vision. And by referring himself to himself in the third person, he's sort of drawing attention away from himself as he talks about the vision. So who is this talking about in this chapter? It's talking about Paul. The second question is, when did this vision happen? Well, in verse 2, Paul says it happened 14 years ago. So what we can do is we can look at the date of 2 Corinthians when he was writing this letter and then rewind 14 years to try to get an approximate date of the vision. Most biblical scholars believe that 2 Corinthians was written around A.D. 55 or 56. And if that's the case, then that would put this vision at around A.D. 41 or 42. Now, some people have looked at this text and have wondered, is Paul referring back to the experience that he had on the road to, uh, uh, to Damascus, which was his conversion experience, where a, a bright light shone from heaven and Jesus spoke to him? Perhaps that is what he's referring to here. Well, that can't be what he's referring to, because we know that that vision on the road to Damascus happened almost 10 years prior to this even. That would have happened in around AD 33 or 34, whereas this one, according to the math, happened about 10 years after that. So he's not referring to his conversion here. He's referring to a later vision that took place in his life uh, prior to his first missionary journey. Other than that, we really don't have any other information about this vision except for what he tells us here in 2 Corinthians. So that brings us to the next question, which is, as he talks about this vision, one of the biggest questions people want to ask is, what on earth is he referring to when he talks about the third heaven? Uh, verse 2 says, I know a man in Christ 
who 14 years ago was caught up to the third heaven, whether in the body or out of the body, I do not know. God knows. Uh, what does he mean here? Well, let's start by talking about what he does not mean, okay? He does not mean that there are three heavens, three separate heavens, and that he somehow was in the third heaven rather than the first heaven or the second heaven. Um, that is not what he means here. If we look at the rest of Scripture, the Bible makes very clear that there are not multiple heavens. And there are some groups today who do believe in multiple levels of heaven or multiple heavens. Uh, one example of that would be within Mormonism. There is an understanding of three separate heavens or three tiers of heaven that people can enter into. The problem with that is it's just not biblical. If you look at the Bible, there is no biblical support for the idea of multiple heavens. Um, and so we, we do not believe that. And I don't think that there is good evidence for that if you look at the rest of Scripture. Scripture makes clear that there really is one heaven, uh, not multiple heavens. So Paul does not mean here that there are three different heavens. What does he mean? Well, in order to get to the bottom of that, what we need to understand is that when the Bible uses the word heaven or heavens, it can refer to multiple things. That same word can refer to multiple things, and it depends upon the context. So sometimes when the word heaven or heavens is used, it's referring to simply the sky, the place where the birds fly. An example of this would be Genesis chapter 1, verse 20, which says, And God said, Let the waters swarm with swarms of living creatures, and let birds fly above the earth across the expanse of the heavens. So in that context, we're talking about the sky. We're talking about the sky that we look at when we turn our heads up and uh, we see birds flying around every day. A second way that the word heaven or heavens can be used is to refer not to the immediate sky where the birds fly, but to the place even beyond that into what we might call today outer space where the sun and the moon are and where the planets and the stars are. And that's another way that the word heavens can be used in the scriptures. So to give you an example of this, in Genesis 1.14, it says, And God said, Let there be lights in the expanse of the heavens to separate the day from the night, and let them be for signs and for seasons and for days and years, and let them be lights in the expanse of the heavens to give light upon the earth. And it was so. There we're talking about the sun and we're talking about the moon. We're talking about things even further distant out. Um, but again, the word heavens is used. And we could point to other passages of scripture where that similar usage is found as well. So sometimes the word heavens can just refer to the sky. Sometimes it refers to uh, the outer edges where the stars and the sun and the moon and the planets are. But then there's another way that the word heaven or heavens can be used. And that is to refer to the place where God himself dwells. Uh, Isaiah 66 verse 1 says, Thus says the Lord, heaven is my throne and the earth is my footstool. What is the house that you would build for me and what is the place of my rest? So there we can see very clearly that the word heaven is being used to refer to the place where God dwells, the invisible place where God lives. So when we consider the various ways that scripture uses the word heaven or heavens, we can see that it can refer to different things depending upon the context. And there are different levels of the way that heaven can be used. Much like today, we use the term sky to refer to one thing and outer space to refer to another thing that's even higher than that. Uh, the writers of scripture would have understood those distinctions as well, and they would have used the same word to sometimes refer to different things. So I believe that when Paul is talking about here the third heaven, he isn't saying that there are three heavens. What he's saying is that he had an experience not just of the sky and not just of outer space, but of the third heaven, the highest heaven, the very place where God himself dwells and where he lives. 
He's not saying there are three heavens in the sense of three celestial places, but he's saying, I had an experience of the highest heaven, the place where God lives, the place above the sky, the place above space and of the moon and the stars. This was a vision of the highest heaven itself. And what's interesting is that if you look in other places in scripture, uh, the phrase highest heaven is sometimes used to refer to the place where God dwells. For instance, in 1 Kings chapter 8, verse 27, it says, But will God indeed dwell on earth? Behold, heaven and the highest heaven cannot contain you, how much less this house that I have built. And that's just one place where that phrase is used. It's used other places as well. But the point is that when Scripture says the phrase highest heaven, it's not suggesting there are lower heavens or levels of heaven. It's simply saying this is the highest place, the place where God dwells in contrast to the sky or outer space, these other ways that the word heaven might be used. And in a similar way, when Paul says the third heaven, that's the way he's using it as well, I believe. So what was the nature of this vision? What was the purpose of this vision? Well, if we go back to 2 Corinthians chapter 12 and read verses 2 through 4 again, here's what it says. Paul says, I know a man in Christ who 14 years ago was caught up to the third heaven, whether in the body or out of the body, I do not know, God knows. And I know that this man was caught up into paradise, whether in the body or out of the body, I do not know, God knows. And he heard things that cannot be told, which man may not utter. Now we learn a couple of things about Paul's vision in those verses. One thing we learn is that it was a supernatural vision. Paul says he doesn't even know whether it was in the body or out of the body. He doesn't know whether God came to him in the body while he was in the body or whether he was taken out of his body and somehow taken up into heaven to have this mysterious vision. It was so supernatural, it was so mysterious that he can't even fully comprehend uh, what the nature of this vision was. So it was a supernatural vision, but he also says a second thing, and that is that he experienced things that cannot be told. In other words, Paul saw things that were so glorious and so divine that he does not have permission to share them. They are things only God has permission to share. Apparently, they were so glorious that Paul says God gave him a thorn in the flesh in order to keep him from becoming conceited about this vision. If you go back to verse 7 again, Paul says, So to keep me from becoming conceited, because of the surpassing greatness of the revelations, a thorn was given me in the flesh, a messenger of Satan to harass me, to keep me from becoming conceited. Uh, we don't know what Paul's thorn was, perhaps a bodily ailment of some kind, but we know it was some thorn in his flesh that God had given him, and it was to humble him. It was to keep him from becoming conceited because the visions that he had were so glorious. And so in summary, we could say, we don't know much about what the nature of this vision was because Paul says he doesn't have permission to share the details. But we do know it was a supernatural vision of paradise, of the highest heaven, the place where God himself lives and dwells. And the final question that some people might ask is this. Why would God give Paul a vision that he didn't want him to share with the world? Usually when God spoke to a prophet or gave someone a vision, it was revealing something that he wanted them to share with the rest of God's people. So why would give Paul give or God give Paul such a glorious vision and then not give him permission to share that with the rest of the world? It's a, it's a very good question. Well, we don't know for sure what God's purpose was in giving Paul this vision. But perhaps God gave Paul this special vision because he knew the hardships that were ahead for Paul. He knew the suffering that Paul was going to endure, and it was going to be a lot of suffering. And perhaps God gave him this vision. Remember we said it was right before his first missionary journey, perhaps he gave him this vision because it would be something that would sustain Paul through the midst of his trials and tribulations. This is the view that John Calvin, the great reformer, took as he commented on these verses. And I want to, in closing, just share with you what John Calvin said. He said this, 
Paul's vision took place for the sake of Paul himself, for one who had such arduous difficulties awaiting him, enough to break a thousand hearts, required to be strengthened by special means, that he might not give way, but might persevere undaunted. Let us consider for a little how many adversaries his doctrine had, and of what sort they were, and farther, with what a variety of artifices it was assailed. And then we shall wonder no longer why he heard more than it was lawful for him to utter. I hope that this has been a helpful explanation for you of this mysterious passage in 2 Corinthians chapter 12. And I welcome you to continue submitting your questions to me. You can submit your questions about the Bible, theology, or the Christian life, and you can send them to askanything at highviewepc.org. And I'll look forward to seeing you next time.